Greetings, everyone. I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis, and I am really pleased to introduce this panel today um, with some really stellar folks who've been working in digital literacies for quite a while and have really interesting things to say, I'm sure, because I've heard them all say interesting things on Twitter, for sure. So without further ado, I'm going to um, pass the baton over to Mary Klon, who um, is one of our uh, most treasured uh, annotator resources. <laughs> and she has worked really hard to bring together this group of great folks to talk about uh, social annotation and digital literacies. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to you, Mary, and we'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A to, to um, get to that when it's appropriate. All right, thanks, Nate. And hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming to our panel on social annotation and digital literacies. Um, so as Nate said, my name is Mary Klon. I am joining you all from San Diego, um, where I teach history at uh, UC San Diego and San Diego Miramar College. And I'm really excited to get into this conversation between all three of these expert educators on um, annotation. It's going to be a lot of really interesting things to discuss. Um, so the format for the panel, we have about 10 minutes per presenter. And then um, I'll introduce everybody like before they start talking. And then we have plenty of time for discussion, for Q&A. So please feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat. I will keep an eye on it. And I'll make sure that we'll get to everything um, in our Q&A session. So is everybody ready? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so um, I uh, will we'll just be going in the order that's in the program. So the first uh, speaker up is Janae Cohn. And she is the Director of Academic Technology at California State University, Sacramento. Um, she writes and teaches about, um, or start, sorry, writes and speaks about teaching in uh, digital spaces and is the author of Skim Dive Surface, Teaching Digital Reading, which is published recently from West Virginia University Press. So with that, I will turn it over to Janae. Thank you, Mary, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Nice to see all of you here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So if you'll give me just a moment to get that hooked up here. I'm happy to speak today to responding to a question about what do I, and I'm imagining a student here, do with a reading, uh, thinking about social annotation as creative practice for online reading experiences. So specifically, what I'll speak to in my 10 minutes here is some thinking around what it looks like to support students in thinking of social annotation, not just as um, positioning students as pure respondents to readings, or even as sort of pure um, Kind of reactors to reading, but as people who can create and build new knowledge from reading as a component of developing digital literacies. So here's how we will um, get at some of those questions today. I'll start by discussing social annotation as creative practice as part of a digital reading framework that I developed in my recent book, Skim Dive Surface. So we'll contextualize this concept with a little bit of groundwork framing. Then I'll move to make the case that social annotation, practicing social annotation, is a reflection of digital literacy development. I'll define briefly what digital literacy means, and we'll bring social annotation into that conversation. And I'll end with some very concrete teaching tips. I imagine if you're here, you're interested in thinking about some ways you might bring this into a classroom practice, even if you yourself are not a classroom instructor. I believe everyone who is a designer or a thinker around um, digital interfaces is, in some respect, a teacher too. So we will talk about some prompts and then a couple of activities before I pass it off to my panel colleagues and before we convene as a group. So in my book, Skim Dive Surface, Teach Digital, digital Reading, um, I composed a framework for digital reading that sort of speaks to five forms of engagement. And really, social annotation activates all five of these forms in different ways. Uh, through social annotation, we curate knowledge we, by highlighting particular moments in the text, by aggregating a variety of different perspectives. We also engage in connection, this ability to see how one idea from the space of a digital text might bridge to other conversations online. This is something that's really unique about social annotation as a digital reading practice, in fact. The ability to pull information from the web and see how that's actively engaged in interaction in online spaces. 
We'll be focusing on this center sort of third category of engagement here, creativity. Because social annotation, I think most uniquely, helps activate for readers the ability, again, not just to respond in a passive way to text, but to really be an active respondent, to be thinking about original and unique questions that might emerge from the group consensus making process or the group um, differences, right? The kinds of um, the divergences in the moment of conversation that can happen uniquely within and from the springboard of the margins. Of course, social annotation also helps us contextualize information. When we're online, we have this unique ability to see how the text itself comes from a larger online framework, whether that's from a certain kind of publication or from an author with a certain set of subjectivities and perspectives. Finally, social annotation might allow us to engage in contemplation as well, the ability to think about why we're reading what we're reading and how our media and our environment shapes the ways that we're engaging with text. When we do paper-based marginalia or paper-based annotation, we're aware too of the material limitations, the ways in which physical margins, fonts, um, spacing, how that impacts where and what we can write. In social annotation online, we might have some new affordances exploded for us, the capacity to write more, to engage with media, to annotate not just with text, but with visuals that might change our orientation. So in many ways, we could talk about how social annotation ties even more deep with all five forms of these uh, ways of engagement. But we're going to focus on creativity today because I do think that this is where social annotation really particularly shines as a way to help students develop digital literacy. So let's unpack that a little bit more. And I'm gonna unpack that through a metaphor. So when we think of being creative, when we think of being original, when we think of helping students construct new arguments or ideas based on text, we might first think of the concept as of sort of individual and unique genius, right? And that can feel like a really heavy lift that can feel very high stakes. But I like to think of helping support students in social annotation as kind of more like taking on a sewing project, hence my image here of some um, thread and some, a ruler, I'm gonna call those uh, that tool in the corner scissors, but this is how you know I'm not really an expert sewer. I don't know what those are. But the point is when you are sewing a piece of clothing, you have a pattern that you're working with. You're not just creating something entirely from scratch. And if you're a novice sewer, you're probably adhering to that pattern in a very strict way. If you're an expert, if you're a contestant on Project Runway, for example, and you're creating new clothing entirely, you might use a pattern as your foundation, but you may riff um, or build upon that as a more expert navigator. And I think social annotation works in a very similar way. There are constraints, there are conventions, there are patterns to follow, so to speak. And that can help students who may be encountering a novel practice really become much more comfortable and confident in that space. That is, social annotation provides a unique form of scaffolding to engaging with digital texts that allows students to feel like they can be respondents to and part of the reading without having to create something entirely new, without having to do something entirely derivative. So how exactly is this a component of digital literacy? Let's break that down a little bit more. And I'm going to be kind of framing this with a, a longish quote from Julie Coro, who is a digital literacy expert. Um, and she defines successful online readers in three different parts. I'm gonna talk through all three parts with us and tie this into social annotation and specifically the act of creating new ideas via social annotation. So Quora writes that successful online readers actively and flexibly regulate, integrate, and adapt their use of digital reading, writing, and communication strategies within a multitude of digital contexts. So even though social annotation is but one context, the idea of actively and flexibly regulating, integrating, and adapting their use has a lot of um, relevance for social annotation, specifically because the ways in which different readers come into the text, because the different kinds of texts that might be interfaced with social annotations from PDFs to active websites that might have multimedia, there is a process of thinking about how students might bring different sets of interactions to those spaces. B, successful online readers approach online reading tasks with an expectation that literacy contexts and their associated context cues will rapidly change in ways they cannot imagine. So with something like a static PDF that students might be reading individually and not in a social context, these changes 
might not be so unexpected, right? The change might just be simply navigating through and encountering new ideas. But when you bring in that social component, when other students might be part of and part of the part and parcel of the experience, um, that's really a component of building digital literacy here where students have to think about how their own responses might change, how their own navigation of the interface itself might change when new voices and new perspectives join in in the digital margins. So as students engage in social annotation, they have to be reorienting their own mindset, potentially not only changing their perspective, but changing the ways, again, they navigate through the text and find ways to be part of the conversation, even as uh, sound, uh, metaphorical sound really because this would come in the form of text but sound and discussion become a part of the space and finally c successful online readers demonstrate resilience cognitive flexibility and a self-directed confidence in transforming strategies used in more familiar contexts into new strategies that are more useful in less familiar contexts and i bolded this last part of Cora's quote because i think it's the most relevant in many ways for thinking of creative social annotation practice as digital literacy development. That is, annotation, contributions to annotations don't just happen magically. <laughs> Students do need some framing, they need those sewing patterns to get into it, to provide the scaffolding to contribute to the conversation, to develop original thought. And when it comes to interacting in a social annotation system or framework, they might be taking familiar contexts um, of reading in other spaces, perhaps in print spaces, but perhaps also in offline spaces, as in word processors or PDF editors, to contribute to the social context and adapt and become that flexible, resilient reader that Quaro is speaking to here. So what does this look like exactly in practice? Um, well, in my book, I outline four distinct goals of social annotation activities, which is to develop shared community dialogue around a reading assignment, understand the variety of strategies and approaches towards annotation as a reading practice, showcase the diversity of perspectives and interpretations of a reading possible within a class community, and spark questions and inspire future inquiry through social annotation practice. So to achieve those goals, we might do a few different things. One, we'll want to start by coming to some shared understanding about what social annotation is and to achieve that flexibility that Quora was speaking to, to develop digital literacy. This might mean demonstrating showing what social annotation looks like, perhaps both in a print context and a digital context, bringing in context that might be both less familiar and more familiar so students can bring their own perspective to this work. Some prompts to do this might be very simple, but these are the kind of sewing patterns that you might use as part of these uh, social annotation assignments. Things like which parts of the reading were the most interesting to you? Which section of the reading did you have a question about or not understand? Which parts of the reading surprised you and why? Or which part of the reading connected with something you learned in class or earlier in the term? How'd that section reinforce or advance what you'd learned in class? These are not particularly novel examples, but they are ones, again, that can activate unique knowledge um, that prompt students in ways that go beyond just saying, comment, <laughs> contribute. We need a little bit of framing to build in that resiliency and flexibility. And once that happens, we can then get really imaginative about the types of assignments we're crafting. You might have students create something like a visual outline of a reading through mapping out the different sets of highlighted moments in the social annotation space. You could have heat maps of popular ideas created once you see which clusters of ideas are most popularly uh, connected to. And you might even use annotation with the benefits of being online to spur creations of things like mini podcasts or audio essays in response to the reading. Now, I know I went through this very quickly, but I am at time. So I'll just say that creativity is a way to do something with the reading. So we hear that question of what do I do? Well, we'll build something new, work with our patterns, and create novel creations from there. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and pass it off to uh, the next presenter. Thank you. Thanks, Janae. That was great. And that was like perfectly on time. I didn't even have to do like a wave my hands thing now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, I am so excited to talk more about this. We're going to talk to Sharice or Sharice McBride is going to share next. And um, she is a digital literacies researcher and teacher educator at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Education. Um, she's a scholar of digital literacies and pedagogy, and her most recent article is Exploring the Edges of Collegiality, a Cross-Case Analysis Towards Humanizing Teachers' Connected Learning, which was published in Pedagogies. And I will hand it over to Sharice.
So I am going to share um, along those same lines of thinking about digital literacy development um, and particularly in this case around um, how teachers, how we see teachers making their thinking visible. So let me pull up mine here. So the work that I've done, um, you'll see that I'm going to contextualize it in a larger project, which many of you here may be familiar with, and that is the Marginal Syllabus Project. Um, I'll, I'll be sharing a bit more about that. Um, but essentially, it has offered an opportunity for us to engage with wide audiences um, around digital annotation, social annotation, and allowing us to ask questions of um, what is annotation? What's the significance of it? So um, in my work with teachers, I work with pre-service teachers and in-service teachers, we're asking questions like, what does it mean to annotate? Um, often we think of the image of writing in the margins, and that's something that teachers can pull on in their own repertoires of practice as they um, continue to build out their digital literacy skills and as they think pedagogically about uh, what this will, what this might look like for their students and particularly in the context, um, a contemporary context of our world that is becoming increasingly digitally mediated. Um, who gets to annotate? Interestingly, I had a workshop where teachers said, oh, that's an interesting question because um, it presents it as an opportunity, whereas in many classes it can sometimes feel like an obligation <laughs> or a responsibility, like, oh, it's not who gets to annotate in that case, it's sort of um, who has to annotate. Um, so we're thinking more broadly about um, annotation as an opportunity or as a privilege as we're able to make our mark on the world and speak with, um, with authors and become authors ourselves. This is a key one for today. What are the risks of annotating? What actually happens um, when we annotate um, for us individually and as a group? And what are some of the possibly negative feelings or experiences that might come up with that? Where does annotation happen? And what are the benefits? Um, so these are just you know framing questions that I continue to think about um, as we're leading educators through annotation practices. But again, that key today I wanna talk about is what are the risks of annotating? Um, if we're thinking about annotation as thinking publicly, um, especially social, digital social annotation, um, there are certain risks that come with that. And so drawing from the work, <clears throat> um, I'll skip that one, drawing from the work with marginal syllabus, I want us to think about how that, um, what those risks end up looking like um, and how we respond to them. So if you're not familiar with it, marginal syllabus is a partnership between three key um, organizations, and that's the National Council of Teachers of English, which publish um, the articles, the, the journals that have the articles that we use um, to annotate, um, the National Writing Project, and Hypothesis. And so what it involves is having a series of reading lists um, that we will put out publicly for folks to dive into, um, to, to annotate, to uh, mark up and share with one another, and to use in their own education settings. So that might be a teacher ed, or even in um, informal learning groups. The key is that we are creating space to have a widened conversation with authors, um, with students, with teachers. And we do that in the margins of text, online, again, using hypothesis. Um, but we also do that on the on the website. Um, sorry, I'm not ready that. Um, we do that on the website through oral conversations where we actually speak with authors and give them an opportunity to share the impetus behind their work and some of the ways that their writing came to be. So it really, um, it really, again, expands that notion of authorship that I was just describing, um, allowing us to see behind that like invisible author that so often exists um, in academic writing. So I would encourage you to you know, continue to look into that if you're interested. But I'm drawing from our definition here of, um, we have a, um, a graphic on our website that talks about why annotate. And I really appreciate this definition um, that frames it as a relationship. So annotation is observing, remarking, noting down. It's the act of marking, it's an act of love, right? Marking up a text is an act of love because of one's commitment to stay in relationship with the creator and with other readers and observers. And that's what really comes forth in our marginal syllabus project because we are, again, directly talking to authors um, and we are, continuing as observers and authors ourselves to further those conversations. And that does take commitment. It does take risk. Um, and so my teaching context, as, I, as I've shared a bit, 
um, is thinking about teacher ed across graduate level mostly um, and thinking about um, digitally connected teacher networks and um, also using some local networks to kind of model these practices. So one of the assignments that I gave my pre-service teachers was coming from the Marginal Syllabus Project and there, it's available on Educator Innovator if you're interested in seeing exactly where this comes from. But um, there's an open access link to uh, a piece by Watson and Bamer that really focuses on how place and space is enacted by you through their digital composing practices. Um, they particularly made songs um, that gave tribute to their home city of Detroit. And so what we had them do was, um, you know, my teachers as learners, I had them engage in annotating that article on hypothesis and then reflecting on their own learning process. Um, I do want to also just mention that <clears throat> as they shared their, you know, as they shared their thinking about it, uh, they did have a specific prompt that was around, um, well, initially we, we gave them just an open kind of uh, conversation and it, again Janae gave us some really good scaffolds that we might use in these settings but our, our, our invitation to them was just mark up the text as you're reading it and so you'll see here um, as an example you know this is what it, it looks like on hypothesis where you have the open access link and then to the right are some of those annotations and I'll get more into those but I just wanted to show what that looks like um, again when they are on the uh, they got to, they got a chance to look at the um, educator innovator website and see the video of the authors um, as they talked about their work in conversation with other educators and then um, afterwards is when they responded with this prompt um, on canvas and a discussion board so it was just an opportunity for them to share what their experience was as they engaged in marginal syllabus and how did those tools basically extend their repertoires of practice, either with annotation or with the digital tools, being in a community of learners. Um, and then some of them, they had the total option to opt out. Um, and some, um, you know, we asked them to share what what had been their broader experiences of annotation and other um, discussion boards and how they might apply this to their practice. So I want to just highlight some of the risks that were um, emergent from those reflections. And I just um, invite us to pay attention to the, you know, affective responses and then the ways that students reflected it on their own, um, you know, burgeoning familiarity with the, with the digital tool. So someone says, uh, the public nature of my comments made me feel both guarded and excited to see who would respond and what those responses would be. Um, I personally do not like to use social media to find connections with strangers. Uh, someone else is, this is really, um, they say, to be honest, I'm still wary of digital tools and find myself focusing on the aspects of the face-to-face -face interaction that are lost when we go into these digital conversations. I want to note this one too, because um, the, the group that I was working with here would be typically characterized as quote unquote digital natives, a, a term at which I um, cringe because it does offer, it, it offers a really flattening way of looking at how um, people within a surge age, certain age bracket might be experiencing digital tools. And we hear, we see here that even though this person would fall in, you know, that category, they, they express some wariness um, around the tools. Um, and then again, someone says, I kind of hated using the hypothesis tool. It was a bit arduous and intrusive to have to install something on my br browser. Um, and so, and then also discomfort. I will mention that when we have that conversation around um, the tool itself and the terms and conditions like this, um, this student brings up, we do talk about the affordances of hypothesis as an open tool where you can take your, your data with you and things like that. Just a side note. So my question um, is, how do we help learners then navigate some of these risks of thinking in public? And I will share briefly, um, this is some of the work that came out of our um, recent article, Anna Smith, Christopher Rogers, and I are thinking about discourses of collegiality. And this is what we term some of the practices we found teachers engaging in digitally mediated spaces, particularly on Twitter. That's where we um, studied this work. So we found practices across these three continua um, that we define as humanizing 
practices. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from these frames to think about how we might use digital annotation. So these discourses of collegiality include how teachers are sharing with one another, how they exercise care, and how they move into experimentation and framing the work that they do online as experimentation. Um, the continua is representative of, you know, the far end is more humanizing practices, and on the left is, um, you know, those that that teachers themselves spoke to as not feeling very humanizing in their spaces. Um, and so just I, in this last bit that I have, I want to highlight um, what that was as, I, as I'm an, um, analyzing the work that my teachers have done on hypothesis, some of the sharing that we see um, is really afforded by the multimodal aspects and the ability to link to other um, pieces. So in this piece, the Watson and Bamer piece, uh, you'll see it highlighted in red there that the versus is the uh, program that was named. And um, you'll see in the margins there that you had uh, experienced and novice teachers sharing about that project and what that prompts for them. So um, Dog Tracks shares um, a, a link to the SoundCloud so students can actually hear or readers can actually hear what was um, produced in that project. And then you'll see others who are saying, thank you for sharing. This is awesome. Um, it gives a, a new dimension to the text. Um, so <clears throat> that's just an example. Um, and where you see also pre-service teachers sharing that they value seeing others' perspectives um, instead of just reflecting on the reading on their own. And, and that's an example of that pedagogic, what's called pedagogically productive teacher talk. Um, this is from Lefstein and others in 2020 um, who share about how teachers are sort of, uh, part of our practice is engaging in conversations that help us to, of course, think about how we're going to teach. And that's one of those humanizing practices that we identified um, in our in our other work on digitally mediated spaces. So the sharing that occurs becomes really um, meaningful. Care is also exercised as, um, as folks in this example um, begin to ask questions with one another. Again, this points to some of Janae's um, framings. I really appreciated that around like, um, not meaning making not just being an individual process right it's a a collective work and so um someone asked like about the difference between space and place and then you'll see a conversation between hannah mk and mushu one two three about their meanderings around what that might what that might mean so they're exercising this is what we characterize as exercising care with one another um as they you know nurture their learning rather than just you know, put things out there and um, hope that others take it up. They're actually engaging in a dialogue together. Um, and the last one uh, around experimentation, we see um, the. I think what I want to highlight there is that experimentation involves feeling the discomfort, but then moving into a space where there is some generativity that's acknowledged in that and continuing. So this this example highlights that. And I know I'm, I'm getting over on time, so I'm going to um, I'll just, these are available to you, but I think this is the final thing just to leave with you is that as we continue to humanize thinking in public, which can be a risky endeavor, um, it's important to acknowledge the risk and then to think about the potential for productive struggle. Um, and that's, you know, these, the aspects that were highlighted, these widened perspectives that teachers get through the space. And when I say teachers, that's teachers as learners. So it could be applied across, um, different populations. Um, more engagement, and then the ability to write for an authentic audience and um, generate work and talk that is meaningful for their practice. So I think that's it for me. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Therese. That was so interesting. <laughs> Yay, I can't wait to talk more about this. Okay, the last one, or the last presenter we have for today is... Paul Schacht, and he is a professor of English, director of the Center for Digital Le uh, Learning at SUNY Geneseo. Um, he is also the director of Digital Thoreau, which is a digital humanities initiative that promotes public engagement and collaborative annotation of the works of David Thoreau. And we're gonna get to hear a little bit more about that um, right now. So I will pass it over to you before I free again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, thanks, Mary. Uh, give me a second to share my screen. 
So uh, Henry David Thoreau is famous for going to Walden Pond in order, as he put it, to live deliberately. When we ask students to annotate, we want them to do that deliberately too. And we want to be deliberate ourselves about the annotation assignments we give. One way to be deliberate about annotation is to do it understanding that different types of annotation presuppose different audiences and different objectives, engage different cognitive capacities, and operate within different epistemic frameworks. A deliberate annotation would be one where against the background of that understanding, you choose what kind of annotation you want to write, and in writing it, you know what you're trying to do. Similarly, a deliberate annotation assignment would be one that's at least designed to solicit the kind of annotation I want my students to write, and at best, designed to sharpen their understanding, not just of the text they're annotating, but of annotation itself as a practice. So I've seen various taxonomies of annotation. I know you have two. Um, the list that you're seeing here, some of the items will look familiar from um, Janae's list. This isn't intended to be novel or definitive uh, or comprehensive, simply to capture some of the variety of things that readers may be doing when they annotate, explicating the text, providing context for it, arguing either with the author or another reader, conversing with another reader without arguing, making some personal connection to the text, maybe sending a message, which is what Thoreau is doing on my cover slide. If you noticed some, some writing at the top there, he scrawled some instructions to the publisher on a page proof of Walden there. Or expressing an opinion, as William Blake does here on the title page of Joshua Reynolds's Discourses on Art, where Blake has written, this man was hired to depress art, this in the opinion of Will Blake, my proofs of this opinion are given in the following notes. H.J. Jackson's book, Marginalia, looks comprehensively at the different ways readers write in their books, and it made me reflect on the fact that even something as brief as a penciled NB in the margin that you see here in my copy of Jackson's book, or a double check mark, or as in the lower right, an asterisk in a circle, personal symbols that I use when I'm reading, these marks have specific meaning for a particular reader and they could also be considered annotations of a sort. At the I Annotate conference two years ago, Gardner Campbell gave a keynote address in which he talked about the potential of annotation to make use of students' knowledge emotions, a term he borrowed from psychologist Paul Sylvia. These are emotions like confusion, surprise, interest, and awe. And I noticed in some of Janae's prompts, she was looking for students to um, tap into some of those emotions as well. These are emotions, Campbell said, which foster learning, exploring and reflecting by forcing us to make some kind of appraisal of our reading experience. Campbell's keynote made me see annotations like these left by a reader on the Gutenberg.org Walden using hypothesis with new eyes. Very intriguing quote, that's for sure. These annotations aren't analytical or informative, but emotive and evaluative. They're not oriented outward to other readers, except perhaps as markers planted on the trail of the text that say to others, you ought to look at this. They're more concerned to register this particular reader's immediate response. Before hearing Campbell's keynote, I would have seen annotations like these as frankly somewhat superficial, at least as a way to fulfill an annotation assignment. Afterwards though, I began to think about deliberately soliciting annotations like these in hopes they might make a valuable starting point for deeper exploration, even for either for the student who left the comment or for another student whose attention is drawn to the passage by the comment. I'll come back to Campbell in a bit, but now I want to pull back in our thinking about annotation types to consider two broad types of annotation, one that I'll call scholarly and another that I'll call responsive. Scholarly annotations are generally intended to share knowledge or a highly informed perspective and are usually directed to an external audience, either other scholars or general readers, whereas responsive annotations register reactions of one kind or another and may either be intended to be read by others or only intended to be read by the annotator. So I run a website that provides a platform for social annotation of Thoreau's works and a while back it occurred to me that the structure of the site offered a way to do some kind of crude comparison of the language of scholarly annotation with that of responsive annotation by simply looking at 
what readers have written there. I could do this because when the site launched, it was seeded with the scholarly annotations from a print annotated edition of Walden from 1995, edited by the late thorough scholar Walter Harding. We simply put these print annotations in the margin as comments by Harding when we launched the site. Since then, some thousands of comments have been left by other readers, almost all of them high school and college students, typically organized into groups that I will set up in answer to an instructor's request. And so here are some of the words. Here to start are the 50 most common words in Harding's comments visualized in a word cloud. Walden and Concord, um, where uh, Walden Pond is located, are the most frequently occurring, not surprisingly. Words like book, journal, and less prominently, edition, are suggestive of Harding's effort to put Walden in literary context. There are also words that point to time, place, and history as contexts. Boston, England, century, years, Emerson, Channing. The words known, according, referring, suggests, and probably seem to bespeak a scholarly effort to establish responsibly and with proper attribution the scope of what can be reasonably asserted about Thoreau and Walden. We can think of these words as both reflecting and establishing the epistemic framework within which Harding is operating. 50 most common words of all other readers combined are quite different. Thoreau is no surprise, though it's interesting that it's much larger than Walden and that Pond and Concord aren't here at all. Many of the predominant words here, nature, life, think, people, world, live, bespeak an interest in identifying key themes in Thoreau's work. The broad difference in emphasis between Harding and other readers that we find looking at word frequencies globally become even more dramatically apparent when we look separately at different parts of speech. Here, for example, are Harding's nouns. And here are other readers' nouns. Harding again. Other readers. Here are Harding's verbs. We see our friends suggest and know again, along with quote, refer, know, think, describe, and say. Other readers use think and say a lot, but also and also describe, but also mean compare, understand, believe, wonder, feel, remind, enjoy, become, change, make, and live. Some of these words point to readers' efforts to interpret. What does Thoreau believe? How is he asking us to live? Others seem more reflective of readers' efforts to articulate their own responses, what they feel about Thoreau, what passages in Walden remind them of, what they do and don't agree with, either in Thoreau's writing or in the comments of other readers. There's an inwardness to some of this vocabulary that seems largely absent from Harding's. Here are Harding's adjectives. Here are other readers' adjectives. Harding again. Other readers. The adjectives seem to offer the most dramatic evidence of two very different readerly orientations. The one, principally concerned with history and the other with states of mind, values, and emotions. We see the same difference in orientation from a somewhat different perspective if we compare Harding's and other readers' longish words, in this case, words of 15 letters or more, on the assumption that such words are one way to get a handle on the intellectual content of the comments. Harding is interested in historical time, and in general, it seems in numbers. He seems more interested in the concrete than the abstract. But there are also some abstractions in this list, including, but not surprisingly, transcendentalism, transcendentalist, transcendentalists. Other readers did reference one century at least, and not surprisingly, they had these words in common with Harding, but they had a lot more 15 letters plus words altogether, and this list is kind of interesting. Again, what they seem to reference primarily is the realm of behavior, emotion, judgment. And finally, the vocabulary of the non-Harding readers seems altogether more conceptual than Harding's. These are other readers' uh, phrases or, or a combination words. Well, I want to come back now to Campbell's 2019 I Annotate, key, I Annotate Keynote, I Annotate Keynote, and remind you that it was in light of his case for using annotation that 
to get students exploring knowledge emotions that this slide suddenly looked different to me. Campbell's keynote also gave me a new way to think about the prominence of that word interesting in the non-harding non adjectives. So the next time I wrote some annotation prompts for my students reading Walden, I decided to lean into knowledge emotions with prompt like, prompts like these. Leave a comment on anything in the bean field that makes you feel joy, wonder, confusion, or anger. Explain your reaction. Find a passage in Walden that underwent a revision you find interesting, explaining what's interesting to you about the revision. Again, you'll note the similarity with some of, some of Janae's prompts. Um, but I, I uh, wasn't satisfied still. And it was that word, those words explain and explaining that I wasn't satisfied with. They somehow, I felt, got in the way of the immediacy and authenticity that I was looking for with my prompts. It's not that I don't think students should reflect on how they feel when they read something, but somehow that word explain just felt too much like a teacher's word, one that almost seems to be a demand for justification. We might think about, in this context, about Charisse's uh, uh, thoughts ab about the risks of annotation, right? What if my explanation is not good enough? Would students be honest about their reactions, I wondered, if they had to justify them? And then in looking at some examples of how non-Harding readers use the word interesting, I came upon this. It's actually not a comment from a student, but a comment from a colleague at another institution with whom I had team taught an online course in which we had students read and annotate Walden. What I love about Deborah's comment is that it expresses a knowledge emotion, but also predicates something about it. It says what's interesting in a way that makes the comment more than just an interjection, more than just, huh, interesting, and instead, a possible jumping off point for analysis. And yet, it doesn't feel like a forced explanation of anything. So here's the set of prompts I plan to use the next time I ask students to annotate a text. And I'll end with these, and I'm looking forward to the discussion about all our presentations. Um, the prompt would be to write a single sentence that takes a form like this. It's interesting that, I'm surprised that, it's confusing to me that, it's funny or strange that, I like that, it bothers me that, I wonder why. I'm looking forward to trying these out and seeing what I get from students. Okay, thank you. I feel like I'm seeing some feedback that suggests that, that people actually, all I could see was, you know, my own slides, I had no idea <laughs> we if I was still connected. <laughs> <laughs> Great. There are some comments in the chat that's like blowing my mind. Everyone likes it. <laughs> um, I so I am so excited to talk about all of these three presentations together because I think they all work so well together. And I have some questions. I have some things I think that all of you will be able to answer and feed off some of the things that you brought up in your talk. So maybe I'll just start us off with my observations and questions, and then we can see what other folks have in the Q&A and the chat too. Um, so I am so interested in the common theme of building confidence in the annotator. So that could be, you know, teacher educators have a whole, this is a whole like another level of confidence you have to build because they're the ones that have to go in, the teachers have to go in now and then build it in their students. The students have to, you know, come to terms with how to you know feel comfortable putting themselves out there and then the instructor has to model that creating those patterns that Janae said um so I think all of you have something to say about that so what's the I mean Paul you sort of ended with this idea of these prompts that are seemingly simple but really sort of provide this jumping off point for um analytical annotations or you know uh, reactions and all that stuff so how best do we if for educators or facilitators, how do we go about building the confidence um, in our annotators? I'll open that up to anybody who wants to answer. Well, I'm, I'm the only one whose mic isn't muted, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to start us off. Um, you know, I, I, I think one important thing um, that we heard in, in some of the other presentations has to do with students' familiarity with the interface that problematic phrase, digital natives, and the problematic assumption that our students know what they're doing and are comfortable um, navigating these interfaces and are comfortable about data questions. 
you know, what's uh, what's being done with my data and, and so on. Um, so I think one really important step to building confidence is to um, uh, be patient with them, help them understand the interfaces, um, make it clear. I mean, I always share with my students how I can get discombobulated by interfaces, the things that go wrong for me. I make a point of having some things go wrong in class demonstrations so they see that things can go wrong for me. Um, but then when it comes to the annotations itself, yeah, I, I, for me, um, a key theme that has emerged in, in my thinking from my experience with student annotations is to make sure that they don't feel like they're being asked to, to write an essay or, or you know, do the kind of writing they're expected to do with essays. So I encourage them to be informal, to leave short annotations. They can always come back and leave more. And then the last thing I'll mention, um, Sharice pointed out the power of um, links and embedded media in annotations. So I encourage them to provide, you know, share links or embed YouTube videos, embed SoundCloud files, um, whatever it is that they might want to share along along those lines. That's great. Yeah, that got me thinking too about um, how we can think about um, the literacy moves that that readers are making and um, emphasize that those moves can be made across. They're, they're tool agnostic, right? We can use other other tools and give them a chance to choose. So um, like the practice that we did of saying you can use hypothesis and we understand that brings up certain considerations. Um, um, being able to identify the risks that students are feeling and then um, talk through them. And, and I think that's really what like digital literacy, digital fluency is about is being able to navigate digital tools as well. So uh, now that you've thought about, this is to the students, now that you've thought about um, the risks and you've been able to maybe try out some of these things, um, identify which one really works for you, right? You can do this on Google Docs, you can do this um, in other ways, right? Um, using hashtags or Padlet or a whole variety of things, but really um, highlight the the skills that we want to develop. And then I, I just want to say that it's important to emphasize that this is needed work, like <clears throat> the ability to support public thinking, to support collaborative knowledge development is a practice that's so desperately needed, um, given where we are, like <clears throat> uh, learning online, um, you know, things have transferred over to the digital environment. And we see the proliferation of like, of course, misinformation and hate speech and these practices, we, we have to figure out how to teach um, these scaffolds around visible thinking um, and, and working through those those risks together. I really appreciate Paul and Sharice's responses to this prompt. I'll just add one other thought here, um, which is really to say that it's also sort of work, I think, unpacking with your students from an uh, affect level what being confident means to them, right? Um, so if we're asking how do we evoke confidence, um, there's a lot of work we could do to kind of understand prior experience um, with annotation and how social annotation, this this sort of the risk of moving to this public space that both Sharice and Paul have spoken to, how that might um, be different for them, how that might be changing what they are experiencing. Um, so really knowing that we have this capacity to build upon that, that prior knowledge should then scaffold to that public facing um, skill experience, um, especially that Sharice is sort of speaking to in terms of the importance of here, right? We know that there's tremendous value in doing this, um, but for students that might not be so obvious if they're not really seeing how it built upon what they might have done prior. Um, the other piece I think that we can think about to that end is, is also creating options too for students, right? So from, you know, both Paul and Sharice spoke to um, the interface is a potential limiting factor um, to confidence with the task, uh, but there may be true accessibility limitations as well. Um, there may be, you know, especially for students who might be engaging in annotation tasks with different kinds of devices, there might just be things kind of outside of our scope of understanding that we can 
we can see right away. So knowing that we can give students those options as different pathways into the task as much as possible um, could also help in, in developing confidence if students see that we're giving them um, those the, the freedom of choice to engage in the task in ways that sort of work for them too. Wow. Okay. Yay. I um I also love what's happening in the chat with people thinking about incorporating reflection into annotation, like thinking about why why we're annotating, like what's the purpose of bringing annotation into the classroom setting? And that's something that I think, Sharice, when you were talking, I came up with the question of like, how do we establish the purpose of annotation and do students play a role in establishing the purpose? Like, are they the a part of this, like figuring out how we're going to do this, why we're going to do this, or are they just sort of people we have to get on board <laughs> or however that is, like leaning into discomfort? Um, and to start their annotation process, or are they like, you know, part of the building from the beginning? Um, I wonder if you all have any thoughts about that, um, about that question. I can just say briefly that <clears throat> definitely um, learning is gonna be more consequential when it is situated in student um, experiences, their desires, where they wanna go with this, you know? Um, and so these opportunities to, um, generate like our frames together. You know, we've seen from <clears throat> my co-presenters here that there are frames we can come up with and I think they're going to be contextual, right? Like what is the, what are we doing in this class? What are some of the disciplinary um, dispositions that we want to, to think about and practice? If we're in a, a chemistry class and we want to um, be finding ways, you know, to identify evidence or hypothesize in certain ways, like those can become our <clears throat> our collaborative frames. And I think in that practice of identifying them together, we will learn a lot as educators, like about what really matters. And that's what uh, what matters to our students. And, and I think that's really where our pedagogy needs to emerge from that student. To build off Sharice's point too, I think that um, it can be very helpful for students to see just kind of a different kinds of authentic examples of what this can look like, um, either based on their experiences or even, you know, depending on disciplinary context or a professional context in which an annotation task is happening. You know, just literally what do what do other thinkers do with with this? What does this look like? Um, how do we support um, and these kinds of dialogues that might be kind of carried on in, in authentic contexts? Um, I think one of the challenges we continue to face um, in education is making that transferable connection very clear um, between sort of, I mean, this is not just true today, this has been true for a long time, sort of translating academic literacies um, to other kinds of literacies that might have benefit or value um, in situated and authentic learning context too. So I, I love that we're focusing on um, metacognition and reflection among other things. I think it's so important for us to help our students understand what they're doing when they're doing it. Um, and I love Janae's idea of having them look at other examples of annotation on a social annotation platform. You know, they're, that's relatively easy to do, have them look at other people's annotations. Um, but, but listening to this conversation, um, I had an idea that I hadn't had before that I'm interested in trying out, which is simply to have students um, rifle through their own annotations of, because because we all annotate, right? I mean, this is one of the interesting things about the challenge of using annotation as a teaching tool. Um, it may seem foreign to students to ask them to do this. They haven't done it in this context, in this way, but they've all done it. And to ask them to, to maybe, um, you know, to to bring to a class meeting um, annotations that they put in the margins of a print text and maybe try to do their own sort of taxonomy of their own annotations. Like, what, what was I doing when I was uh, making these marks in the margin? Try to categorize them and, and share those out. It would be one way to start getting them to be more reflective about their practice and, and ease them in to the, to the um, situated annotation we want them to do in our classes. That's really great. I am. Um, so I was thinking when I was listening to you, Paul, about my AP English teacher in high school who just said, 
you have to mark up this reading. And she didn't have any sort of explanation on what that meant. It was just like, she just came around and made sure we had notes to prove that we read. And it was always so confusing. <laughs> you know, it's like, what do I write? <laughs> but that, like seeing like, well, there's a, like there's symbols, there's things that we write or underline when we're writing just or annotating just for us versus when we're talking to each other. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of things to keep in mind. So yeah, and if yeah, I may, oh, sorry, Mary, just, I'm just building off your thought, you know, if I, I may, I think one thing that's really valuable about what you just said, too, is that annotation can so easily become part of a hidden mm -hmm. curriculum, right? That students who learn how to annotate have had access to certain discourses that other students have not had, right? And we could probably track that hidden curriculum, you know, on our spectrum of, you know, of, of privileges, right? Um, so I think the more that we can make visible um, the ways that we discursively engage in annotative spaces too. It's also an equity-based practice if we're giving these kinds of assignments. So yeah. just throwing that out there. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like even, and that relates to what Paul was saying too about the response, like even inviting people to say, that's interesting. <laughs> that can be so powerful because then you get people into the conversation that weren't there before. Yeah. Um, so there is a question in the q and I wanted to bring up um, and it's about kind of logistics, which form of hypothesis or annotation software do you all prefer? Is it the one that's loaded into the LMS, um, the free one? Do you have any pluses and minuses of either that you want to chat about? I think this I is kind really of- have... <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Jenny. <laughs> you go first, Sharice, I'll go after you. Mine is brief. I don't, I don't really have um, a preference per se. Um, just noting that using it within the LMS is private um, rather than public. And that's that's meaningful for in its own right, you know, being able to have those scaffolded environments. Again, learning to navigate um, these practices without some of those additional high stakes that might come in a public space. Um, so that's, I guess, an affordance of the, the LMS and Yes, I'll, I'll build on this, this with my technologist cap on, um, which is that Sharice makes a really good point about the private nature in the LMS. You can create private groups um, within the browser-based version to outside the LMS, but the LMS adds that additional layer of security, right? So if you are concerned with things like using single sign-on authentication uh, to access course information, if you're tying uh, the use of annotation to any of your grading-based practices, there are FERPA implications um, that um, you may want to think about when you use it in the LMS. So specifically, um, you know, if you're going to give any kind of assessment-based data within your annotation practice, it is much safer to do so behind a single sign authentication paywall. Um, not a paywall, just login wall. <laughs> what am I saying? Um, then it is to just kind of have students create free accounts and, and be building from that perspective. Um, I'd also encourage you, again, with technologist cap on, if you're trying to finance this question, to talk to your campus IT group um, or your campus librarians, you know, whoever is kind of the administrators for these kinds of um, LTI integrations, uh, they're going to know a lot about the testing and security practices and accessibility practices that can also help you determine uh, which version will be the best choice for your yeah. students for protecting them. And uh, your instructional design staff might also be great for helping you determine how you might scaffold these kinds of tasks, right? So how important is the annotation to some of your core assessment-based practices in the class um, might be another factor to think about. Um, in term and, and what kind of feelings do students have about the LMS? That matters too, um, in terms of whether that integration um, is supportive of your pedagogy. Yeah, I'll just say um, I think that the, you know, they're they're all great. Um, they have different, somewhat different affordances. I, you, you can have students annotate in Google Docs, and that that can work. Um, but the key thing is what we've been talking about, making sure that um, whatever platform is being used, students have control over their comments, whether they're seen publicly or not. And so the, the LMS provides one way to do that, but um, Hypothesis allows for private groups um, where you know the the comments could only be seen by members of the group. I've set that up 
Um, the Reader's Thorough website uses Comment Press, and um, the groups that I set up for classes there uh, can be private or they can be public. They can also be showcase groups so that the comments can be seen by the public but not interacted with by the by the public. Um, I, I just think you know students ability to have control over the visibility of their comments is a key thing. The last thing I'll say about this is um, I've watched with excitement the development of Hypothesis over a number of years, maybe five, six years ago, I had a really interesting email exchange with Jeremy Dean at Hypothesis um, where he was wondering why I wanted to use Comment Press, which is a, a plug into WordPress, because it groups the, um, it attaches the comments to paragraphs and not to, um, to strings of, of letters in the text. So it's, it's hard in comment press to tie a comment to a targeted bit of text. In a long paragraph in particular, that can be a bit confusing. Um, and it was a really interesting email exchange. I won't go in the, into the details, but um, I, I like them both for different reasons. I think somehow in some ways when the comments are organized at the paragraph level, it can be a little bit easier to navigate your way through it. The, it's not as overwhelming as it is when you see all that yellow highlighted text. But I've, I've had students use both and the important thing is that they're annotating. That's great. Yeah, there's um, that's, there's a lot to keep in mind actually. When you all started talking, like I realized how complicated that question actually is because issues of control and privacy and and equity and access and all that stuff. It's like all those considerations matter. So that's great. Um, so I have one more question. <laughs> I mean, I have many questions, but I'll ask one more. So it was something else that Sharice said when you said you invite the creator and the author into annotations to discuss things with um, the annotators or the readers. Um, that's really interesting and something I wanted to hear just a little bit more about what that does to change the dynamics of a discussion. I teach history, so a lot of my creators are dead, <laughs> dead and gone. <laughs> so I like, you know, if I'm annotating a primary source by Thomas Jefferson, there's like a power in that because students can really tell Jefferson what they think and he's not going to talk back to them. <laughs> but there's just like an interesting thing that comes out when you're actually humanizing the creator. Like there's there's somebody behind this text and there's a, a different element of the discussion that can emerge from that too. So I wanted to hear from all about what that what that adds to the conversation or any, yeah, if you know, Thoreau is also dead. So what <laughs> kind of things are we talking about when we're um, annotating historical texts versus others? Well, I can speak to uh, what it's looked like in marginal syllabus. And I think um, the larger question of authorship really brings in some um, great, you know, pieces around like digital literacy development of the readers and understanding the writing process or that, you know, this this writing is a process. And um, and we've seen that with um, I, I know in some of the reflections I've seen um, students have said, I didn't. I didn't think about my um, this. I didn't think about the readers of the text or the writers of the text this way. And so they get to like see them. They get to see what other educators um, are talking to them about in person, you know, uh, on the video. Um, and I think there's also the power of um, being able to take those those transcripts and kind of think about like from the from a pre-service teacher perspective when they see other educators in conversation with these authors that also helps them to think about like um their pedagogical practices um so that's one that's one piece of it but there's there there are great benefits to um being able to have that conversation going but i think the pieces around what happens um you know with with authors who aren't here is also important for us so yeah you know i i one of the things i find I'm not sure whether I'm answering the question exactly, but one of the things I find really compelling about um, having students do annotation is that um, it creates the opportunity to speak 
back to the writer as though the writer were alive, even if the writer is not, right? In a way that's a it's a bit different from what you're doing if you write an essay. You're also kind of speaking back to the writer or or speaking about you know, you're in conversation with the writer when you want to analyze what you think the writer is up to, but not in the direct way that you are when you are annotating. I think this is also part of customary annotation practice. You know, you're reading a Jane Austen novel and you write, you know, yes, explanation point in the in the margin or no or what, you know, but it's as, it's as though that person is present for you. And I think annotation makes that happen in a way that the the conventional essay about an author doesn't. Um, I've uh, I've had students um, connect with thorough scholars, both in the margins of some of these texts and then, you know, by by video chat after they've gotten to know them a little bit in the margins. Um, that can be really powerful as well. So it's not connecting, not connecting, uh, you know, with, you're not bringing the author back to life. Uh, then the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, I mentioned that we we launched the Reader's Thorough site with Walter Harding's annotations put in as comments. And there was something about that in particular when we created a little avatar for him. Um, it happened then, you know, and not really before that suddenly it was like he was alive there in the text, um, speaking to the readers of the text in a way that I don't think it feels he's doing if you're reading his print annotations in a print copy of the text. These are wonderful examples. Thank you for, for both of these, uh, <laughs> Paul and Charisse. Um, I think the only other thing I'll mention is just when you're working with historical texts versus um, contemporary texts, you know, Paul has already listed a number of sort of like imaginative and creative ways that you'd kind of bridge the past and the present. Um, and so I think that another kind of imaginative way you could do this and think about this is by thinking about all kinds of artifacts from historical context that you could bring into the annotation process, things like maps, things like, um, uh, you know, archival uh, footage or documentation, it depends on how historical we're talking here, I suppose. Um, you know, there's all kinds of linking or kind of forms of connection that you can do um, to larger historical uh, context that can really make that historical conversation very rich, even if the authors uh, themselves are no longer alive. You can do the same thing with contemporary texts, of, cor of course, as well. Um, but the point is, I think, with the historical work, you have this real uh, opportunity to think about how written dialogue um, sustains certain kinds of conversations. And that sort of texts are not sort of these like neutral, floating, isolated sort of <laughs> uh, moments in time, but are part of a larger fabric, um, historically speaking. There's this power, there's this power of being able to annotate and think about uh, historical documents is to Paul's point, being alive still, as you continue to kind of unpack and bridge and think about what those implications are for our contemporary uh, context. Yeah, I love all that. I'd like to say one last yeah. thing uh, around the the having folks in person or having folks who are alive um, and annotating their text. One key consideration that we always like center in this work is permission. And so being able to make sure that the authors um, have, you know, granted that permission to share their work and to have it in common um, in conversation really helps to, um, again, demonstrate like that practice of um, like peer, you know, peer, I wouldn't say peer review exactly, but you know, like refining our thoughts together. Um, they, they are, I think they're embodying that. And we also, I honor that. And I share that with the readers that I'm introducing to this work that they've given us permission and they, this is going to keep furthering the, the, um, the development of these ideas. Um, we can take that up. They, they're going to take that up. And so <clears throat> it becomes again, generative practice. Um, but reciprocity and, and permission are really key values of, of mine as I care. Yeah, that's really great. That just builds up the whole, I mean, the community as a whole, because you're asking, everybody is exchanging on, you know, everybody's giving their permission to take the risks, right? <laughs> to build up that. That's awesome.
Um, there is another question in the Q&A, so I'll ask that. Um, so it's from Chris Aldrich says, I am curious if anyone on the panel is helping students move their data thoughts into personal platforms to take their notes with them and build on or expand upon them. And what does that look like in the long term for students? That's a great question. I'll kick us off on this because I'm actually going to have to leave <laughs> the panel a few minutes. I have a schedule conflict right after this. So I'll, I'll kind of say my piece to listen and then I'll have to leave. But um, the short answer is yes. Um, we have a lot of conversations in the classes I've taught about options for transferability. Um, and I think options are always key, right? You want students to have agency over their, their thoughts because annotations are a form of intellectual property. Um, so we do want to be mindful of students sort of having ownership and agency over their ideas. Um, so one way we'll talk about that is by helping students sort of learn about a variety of uh, tools, both that go supported by the institution and those that you know, may not, that might be more personal proprietary platforms, um, how they might share or save things, how they might archive their knowledge, what those choices look like, both online and offline. Um, in other words, and, and with paper, right? We sometimes talk about uh, note taking too, something you can still do in an analog capacity as well, um, but present those options um, in a way that honors, again, what students might value from their notes too. Um, so sometimes, so usually this is for me just kind of like I will create like a sort of toolkit in the classes I'll teach with just like, hey, here are some tools to think about uh, to support you. Again, here are the ones our IT department supports where you can get help. Here are the ones that they don't support, but that you might still want to think about using for these reasons. Um, and we go from there. So that's kind of my short answer to that question. But yes, I think that making the transferability of the academic literacy transparent is a really great idea. I'd like you to hear what uh, Sharice and Paul are thinking. I, I haven't done what Chris is asking about, but it's a great idea. I will do it. Um, uh, I know that um, you know an account user can see all of their hypothesis um, comments in one place. I haven't played with downloading um, that. To, to speak to the question of agency and ownership, I mean, the, the terms and conditions of the, of the Reader's Thorough website are that your data belongs to you. Or if you if you want it deleted, you can request it to be deleted. It'll be, you know, it will be deleted. Um, but I will think about how to make it easy for them to actually download it and do stuff with it, particularly in digital humanities contexts, where maybe what they would want to do is do some text analysis of their own writing and see what they find. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great question. And um, I just, like Paul, I want to keep building that out. Um, I will mention on the technical side, there is um, the crowd layers tool <laughs> behind um, with marginal syllabus that allows folks to see patterns. It's a learning analytics tool that allows folks to see yeah. patterns in like, uh, well, maybe not, well, they can create patterns and analyze those patterns, but it, it allows them to see um, the, the analytics behind who's annotating articles. So I put that name in the chat. Yeah, thanks. So that's, I think that's a tool once we've think about, you know, our pedagogy, which is the most important. Very cool. Thank you. Um, is there anything else you all have? Do you have questions for each other or anything else you want to say? I know, Janae, you have to head out pretty soon. Is there anything else you want to mention before you go? Yeah, and I'm sorry I have to leave a few minutes before our panel is officially over, but just want to thank um, everyone for their contributions today. I agree, Mary, with your assessment that these topics worked really well <laughs> together. There was great cross dialogue and conversation. So I look forward to um, keeping track of the excellent scholarship mentioned in this panel, um, as well as staying in touch on the internet where we all live. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. I'm I'm going to log off. I know we still have a few minutes left, but I appreciate everyone's um, contributions today. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. See you around the conference. Thank you, Janae. So, anything else, Paul and Sharice? Anything else you want to share? Or um, questions you have for each other? We have about ten minutes left. No, I think this has been rich for me. I have a lot of notes <laughs> that will continue to shape my thought and conversation with you all. Um, so I'm looking forward to 
to more of the conference and uh, staying in touch. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I'll just add um, that, uh, you know, I had not met Sharice, Mary or Janae before we got together not very long ago to, to get ready for this. And I'm just amazed at the amount of overlap and convergence in the in the issues that we're talking about and the ideas we have and the challenges that we see um, anyone is going to face in um, making this work in a pedagogical context or, or you know just around annotation in general. Um, you know, I'll I'll toss out one last um, issue that we haven't talked about that our, our students are, are not likely to face, but that writers on the open web face. Um, and this came up for me in a piece that Audrey Waters wrote, um, objecting to the fact that people were leaving hypothesis comments on her blog. She was writing on the open web and had deliberately turned off the comment capability in on her blog, um, she was got, getting a lot of nasty stuff um, in response to some of what she wrote. And um, But then lo and behold, she found people um, saying mean things <laughs> in hypothesis comments, which are a separate layer that she didn't have to look at and that other readers wouldn't necessarily look at. But it just bothered her that they were there. And I know and some of the, the hypothesis folks who are in the meeting may know more than I do about conversation that she had with hypothesis about it. Um, this is this is I have never settled with myself exactly how I feel about this. People were were, you know, essentially um, engaging in constitutionally protected speech, um, but they were using the technology, that they were you know, layering the hypothesis technology over her site in a way that felt intrusive to her. And I, I think it's a fascinating, and I haven't seen anything you know, about this since a couple of years ago. I don't know whether it continues to be a live issue or others have raised it. I think it's a really interesting question at the crossroads of speech and democracy and privacy. So I heard I heard that topic come up, and so I I popped back up on stage in case <laughs> in case y'all wanted me to say anything. Um, one thing I'll have to say about that I love that this panel had like the full amount of time to really unfold and explore a lot of different things, almost to the point where we're like, maybe we've actually come to the end of the discussion now or not. Just then Paul raises like one of the thorniest issues ever possibly. But I mean, my quick response to that is that, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I am a, uh, a study of, um, you know, power and knowledge and discourse. Like that's my, that's what I think about. And, you know, someone like, Audrey sits at a very different intersection of power and knowledge as an independent scholar, not affiliated with an institution, than say the president of the United States does. Um, and so I don't, I think a lot of people when they're considering the issue about all the things that you raised, Paul, about this, this intersection of privacy and free speech and everything, a lot of people are reaching for some sort of rule that will work everywhere for everyone. And I, I guess I feel like that's not really going to be a fruitful path for us. I think it's always going to have to be a more complex contextual thing that happens, just like speech is in almost every case, right? And I'll shut up. I appreciate that, Nate. I, I don't think that there is a, uh, a blanket solution, a one-size-fits-all solution to the issue. There have been quite a few sessions at other gatherings, other I annotates and so forth, where where people have have wrestled with it, and it's never really quite come up to you know, no one's found like the magic bullet that solves yeah. the whole problem, you know, as if a bullet would solve anything. But, anyway. 
Wow. <laughs> to be continued. Yeah. <laughs> to be continued. Oh, for that really simple, like, non complicated question. <laughs> It's really interesting. I actually hadn't heard of that. And now there's like a lot of links and stuff in the chat that I really want to go look at and read. Um, but it did remind me a little bit of what Sharice was saying with that, like asking permission, especially with authors that you're sort of inviting discussion. But there's a whole other layer when it's not for a class. It's not like this structured conversation where there's a facilitator and an instructor there. It's just like you're out there on the Internet. So that's a whole other thing. So I have nothing wise to say about this <laughs> except i'm i'm interested <laughs> um sharice do you have the solution <laughs> for this problem <laughs> no no solutions but i think as is the nature of inquiry we're we're kind of seeing these things evolve i think it comes up somewhat just the right to data um your own you know this i heard someone mention earlier intellectual property and i think that digital <clears throat> the digital is really challenging some of that um, in our laws, in the ways that we conduct IRB, ethics, you know, there's a difference between, um, you know, what's okay and what's, um, <laughs> what's right, you know. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, I just, I think these are important considerations to keep taking up. Not my area of expertise, per se, I just kind of generate it from the humanizing aspect and, yeah, uh, more considerations of, of ethics. Um, so. That's, I think that's all I have to contribute about that. <laughs> well, I am glad you used the word humanizing. I think that's important. Like for all of the players in this, like the, if we're talking about uh, annotating in the classroom for the teacher, to, for the students, for the author, whoever, like it's all important to us to recognize like, human beings <laughs> in the internet <laughs> or are you using the internet? <laughs> and now the, the, this might become like an incredibly, uh, you know, uh, turtles all the way down discussion. But um, later in the week, um, we'll, uh, Rami Kalir and Ontario Garcia are going to be discussing their book, Annotation. Um, and they have a really good chapter on this subject, I think. Oh, well, there it is right there. <laughs> She's got, you know, I think I have mine right here, too. How many people have their annotation book? Um, but I think this... There, they have a chapter that specifically talks about the, you know, the power knowledge, you know, intersections that happen in annotation. And I think it's that we could just talk about that. And we'll, I know, I think Rami's in the audience right now. So we'll, we can feed him that as well. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that talk. Me too. <laughs> Rami yeah. says duly noted. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, it's two minutes to 1130. Is there anything else, any last questions or come in from the chat or anything else you all want to say before we wrap up? I just want to thank both, all of the presenters, Janae, Paul, Sharice, for all the things you said. I took a ton of notes and it's been really interesting. Um, anything, last thoughts? Thanks for doing a great that, job Paul. of moderating. <laughs> last time you did that, Paul raised a really good yeah, never mind. No, <laughs> careful. No more things. <laughs> I just I just wanted to thank Mary for a great yes. job of thank moderating you, and 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 for uh you know for the opportunity to be part of this terrific discussion. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was really fun. And thanks to Nate and Freddie and, and Remy for, for asking me to come on board. It's been really, really cool. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>